Hello and welcome to all of you joining us here at the Happiness Festival hosted by the Happiness Institute at Oxford in association with Gowing Life and Oxford University Scientific Society. Today we are joined by Robin Ince. Robin is a comedian, author and science broadcaster. He is probably best known as the co-host of BBC Radio 4's award-winning science podcast, The Infinite Monkey Cage. Welcome Robin, it's an absolute honour to have you with us here today. Oh, it's a, it's a lot. I, I, I really enjoy all of these different ways that we have now. Everyone has just upped their ability to communicate across the whole world. I mean, it's, a, it's been great in terms of like we're doing a new series of Infinite Monkey Cage and no one's got an alibi. No one's got an excuse not to do it. So suddenly <laughs> we're able to get four astronauts together and that kind of thing because we don't have to get them in the same room. So I love all this kind of stuff. It's great. No, it's wonderful. And thanks for joining us. In fact, we were just having a chat about how, how long we've been trying to get you on uh, on our show. So. Uh, thank you for, for coming now. Uh, for everyone, we'll be, we'll be having a live Q&A session at the end, uh, so feel free to post your uh, questions for Robin uh, anytime during the discussion, either on the Facebook or YouTube live stream comment sections. Uh, for now, I'll hand over to Chris, who will be leading our interview today. So take it away, Chris. Hi, guys. Thank you, Matt. Hi, Chris. And, um, I'd like to start off, Robin, uh, just by talking about how you first became interested in, in the sciences and why they appealed to you. I know the likes of Carl Sagan and Richard Feynman were big inspirations to you. Well, I think it's an interesting thing, which like a lot of people, I was really interested. I had the childish zeal when I was a child to, to be excited by science. And then I think a lot of us, we hit a wall with sometimes education. Sometimes you find that science becomes detached from the world. This strange thing, which is is everything in the world has some, you know, the way that we can understand, it becomes a series of equations. It becomes a series of sums that are separate from your life, from the sky and all those things. So really from about the age of 14 to probably my mid-20s, I it, it wasn't really part of my life. It was, uh, I, I did... Uh, well, the, the A levels I did would have been economic politics, uh, history, Renaissance history, and, and English. So it was like totally there was no no science there at all. I did an English degree, and um, then at about the age of twenty five, I bought a book by a guy called James Randi, who is best known as uh, uh, both a conjurer and a skeptic, one of the one of the leads of the skeptic movement. And it was all about paranormal investigation and some of the kind of bunkum in there, and that just really interested me. This idea that we are so easily, you know, charlatans can manipulate us and, 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 and take money off people. And, you know, I find things, you know, the psychic medium world, particularly kind of, of scurrilous and, and, and what that can very often feed off. And that then led me to Carl Sagan's Demon Haunted World, which I, as a kid, I'd loved Carl Sagan's Cosmos. I would have been 11 years old when that, that was first on television. It was an amazing experience. And then at the age of 27, uh, Demon Haunted World came out. I read it. And that was really really the way that I got back into wanting to know more about why the universe and why we are as we are. And so it was, yes, yeah, so there was a period of time where it really was apart from science fiction movies, that was it. And then bit by bit, I also managed to kind of combat the, the problem, which I think many people have when they return to science is how hard it appears to be because it has a language, even in popular science, it has a language, which is not the language in all the other kind of novels you might be reading or, or autobiographies or biographies. And then once you go, oh, yeah, you don't finish a book and go, now I understand that subject, it's done. You finish a book on quantum mechanics or on the nature of black holes and you go, whoa, there's a lot of things there, aren't there? It's quite confusing, some of those ideas. And uh, am I really, I'm, I'm a hologram and the nature of time, so it's, it, it, it's not one certain, blo there's a block universe. And once you realize you're in for a long period of confusion with moments of elation and moments of kind of joyful understanding, once you can take that on board, then you're going to stay on the ride, I think. So obviously, then you 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 went into comedy, and that was your that was your profession. Where did the your the worlds of science and comedy first collide for you? Well, it was. I mean, I'd been reading science for a while, and I remember one of the stand up shows I did had a lot more kind of stuff about skepticism and certain bits. Of it. I mean, one of the things that happened was I was the first show that I did in, in the, any of those themes was predominantly kind of skeptical, and then I thought, well, that's easy. It's very easy to mock people and sometimes you're you're mocking the wrong people you're not mocking the manipulators you're mocking the manipulated and you have to be careful on that and I thought well actually the more fun thing is can I turn some of these scientific ideas I'm reading about into stand-up and one of the things you have to do is if you're trying to turn something into stand-up and get to a punchline you have to have some level of understanding of what the idea is 
or the punchline doesn't work. And, you know, the, the first few science jokes I did, I kind of would have hands up from PhDs and professors and various others saying, well, I'm afraid you haven't entirely understood what Schrodinger was attempting to express with this particular idea. Um, and then I, I used to do a show called The Book Club, which was a variety show, which mixed up lots of... I used to read from strange novels about giant killer crabs with an accordion backing, and then I'd have all manner of kind of puppeteers coming on and opera singers and sketch troops. And after a while, I thought, well, it's great doing a variety show that's just silly, but I wonder if I can create a variety show which is about scientific ideas. I wonder if there are so many people like me who have just who gave up on science and felt that they did not have the minds that were required and maybe if I sneak in a scientist amongst the musicians and amongst the, you know, jugglers or whatever it might be, if, if I start sneaking in a theoretical physicist every now and again, then I just build on that. So that was it, really. It was about 15, 16 years ago where I started to put on shows where I would I'd ring up a scientist or get in contact with someone and say, hey, Ben, ben Goldacre was one of the first, actually. Ben Goldacre, I, I said, hey, Ben. You know, we'd, we'd met for some other reason. I said, do you want to come and do a 10 minute set just about epidemiology or whatever? And he was like, yeah. And then he did about an hour long set. And since then I've learned that about, you know, there's a fascinating thing. Scientists who of course, many of them do understand that the nature of time is possibly an illusion definitely declare it's an illusion when you say it's a tight 10. They do an hour and you're kind of waving and they presume the waving is just some kind of trick of the imagination as well. So so Ben Ben, and then Simon Singh and then I, I did a couple of things with Brian Cox and then people like, you know, Helen Chersky, who I work with a, a, a lot as well, and Alice Roberts and all of those different people. And it was just, so it just kind of built and built. And, and then I did it about 13 years ago, 12 or 13 years ago, I, I put on a show at the Hammersmith Apollo. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm giving you very long answers. You probably don't need answers this long. I'm giving you too much there. We'll stop there. We'll stop there. Well, I imagine these two worlds, are, you know, they're very distinct and different worlds, science and comedy. Uh, when, you know, in comedy where you're surrounded by extroverted people in the science world, where you're often star stuck in a dark, dusty corner of some long forgotten lab, twiddling dials or refrigerating sort of questionable liquids but do the do the personalities of these worlds share any similarities and what can they learn from each other Oh, I think there's a huge similarity. I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, I've, I've described in the past the fact I think a lot of comics are what I would consider to be extremely lazy scientists. They're fascinated by ideas, but there's no way they're going to sit for five years, 10 years, 50 years trying to work out. The, once they've got to the pun of that idea, that might be enough for them. So I think that the curiosity is very shared. You know, all the stand ups that I hang around with are people with full bookshelves always talking about different weird films and documentaries they've seen and and I often find in the green room there's a huge I mean it's a beautiful thing when you talk about the kind of you know the the, the dusty solitary nature of scientists I love the fact the Cheltenham Science Festival uh that when that was in in the early days the hotel that where they use for the scientists the jazz musicians when there's a jazz festival that um they wouldn't give the science festival the same uh budget price as jazz and classical music because they, they there's no way that the bar takings would be as big you know jazz musicians be of course what they found out immediately is once you release scientists from their dusty corners with their questionable liquids uh they go brilliant these are not questionable liquids we know and everyone was drinking and gregarious and i do f i find you know scientists and comedians really like hanging around together because they've both got questions for each other i mean i find paul nurse who's who's quite brilliant obviously nobel prize winner and you know the crick institute all those things I, I love hanging around with someone like him because not only does he have this you know incredible the you know the fecundity of his mind is, is, is remarkable but he's someone who can't understand how on earth i could go and do comedy and i have to try and explain and he goes oh my god the nerves i don't know how you do it and i go but i don't understand paul you've changed the possibilities of human beings with uh, and i love that thing that very often comedians with scientists see all of the, you know i'm such an imposter i'm sat with a nobel prize winner and for some reason scientists feel that they're imposters even though they've improved and changed the world because they're sitting with someone who just shows off for a living so there's lots of really great kind of uh very happy arguments that come out of it as well yeah, I think that combination of alcohol and curious minds is sort of a, it's a match made in heaven. 
Yeah, and it really, I mean, that's one of the faster, I mean, with Paul Nurse, I remember, I think it was the one of the uh, the, the British Science Association in Birmingham one year, and there was a, I used to talk about this, sound, there was a brilliant moment, we'd been at this event, and Paul and uh, we'd been chatting together and having a few drinks, and then we got to the cab to take us back to the hotel, and, and Paul couldn't work out how to open the taxi door, and I used to talk about, you know, the joy when you actually find yourself explaining something to a Nobel Prize winner, when you actually go, well, what you need to do, Paul, is the hand needs to go a little bit further under then it's a lift and then a pull back and you go yeah okay you understand the way the universe works but i can open doors that's one to tell the grandkids that. Yeah. <laughs> and so one of your shows that you performed in the past was uh called happiness through science what what did you explore in this that was, you know what, it's so many shows ago, I barely remember. Um, I think that one in particular, that was before, I did a show about Darwin after that. That, sh- and then there was a, yeah, that, that one was meant to be one of the kind of uh, the bridge shows in terms of saying, here's lots of beautiful ideas that come from the scrutiny and curiosity that the scientific method requires. So I, you know, there's a lot of, I, I talk very basically about different ideas of kind of quantum mechanics. I talked a little bit about the life of, of, uh, of Richard Feynman. Uh, sometimes I put in some stuff about Marie Curie as well. It was lots, it was a real hodgepodge of loads of different ideas, which were to say that that illusion that scientists are this separate breed that go, hello, I've finished counting everything now and I've made a sum. There we are. Thank you very much. We're the artists and we're having a fabulous time using our imagination. So it was about, you know, I think I, I'm going to misquote Einstein now where he said from logic, you can go from A to B with imagination. You can go wherever you want. But I, that was part of what it was about. It was about the fact that imagination is a vital part of scientific advance. And I think we're seeing a lot more. Again, I think that's why artists and scientists get on. I think if you if, if your drive is not, you know, the, the, if it's just the ego, which of course it's not for most people that I read, you know, if it is about the curiosity and the delight, what Constable, the great, you know, British painter Constable, he would talk about the idea that his canvases were experiments. They were experiments of how he was perceiving Salisbury Cathedral or that Hay Wayne or whatever it might be. And in so I think, you know, with artists, there is that imagination. Both Both groups of people are using imagination to go, here is my subjective perception. Had, at what point does it start to become an objective perception? And of course, with art, it never has to be an objective perception. I mean, I, I realize objective perceptions are ultimately an impossibility. But as we know, with you know certain areas of, of physics and, uh, and, and science broadly, you can narrow it down to say this is about as objective as we get in terms of understanding. Whereas science, whether it's cubism, you know, minimalism or whatever, you don't have to have an objective result. How do you think spending time with you know scientists and comics has grown you differently have you have you gained different things from like the different professions or i probably have and i probably don't realize what it is quite a lot of the time i mean there's, there's you know the, the my fascination with science I think it does change the way that I scrutinize things. So I think in one way it does help with stand-up because stand-up is looking at the world and what is beyond it and going, hmm, what can I do with this? How can I turn this into a story? How, what, what is the interesting thing? I mean, the one thing that I think it certainly made me in the last 10 years in particular is for me one of the vital things about the shows I do is that they have to be interesting as well as entertaining. Now, that's not to dismiss the comedians who just do a, a, you know, a, a series of jokes and create joy. That is fantastic. But I want there to be ideas that people will later on get in contact and go, hey, I, I saw X to Phoenix. And I was just wondering, right, there was this, this, this person you talked about, or the, the, this idea. I want to make the idea stickier. So that, that becomes, you know, when I was first to stand up for many years, the most important thing was the laugh. And now... I still want it to be funny, but I want it to have something which might change. It's, you know, it is that thing that sometimes when you read a certain book or you see a certain artist, the universe is changed for you when you leave that room or when you put that book down. 
And I, it doesn't mean it doesn't have to be some great Damascene moment, but it just means that you're looking at the stars or you're looking at the rain or you're looking at a reflection and it's slightly different. You are able to see more in it. You know, I think a lot of it is rooted to the, the famous Feynman moment, which is uh, yeah, where he sits in a chair. He says, I've got a friend who's an artist. And sometimes he says something I don't agree with too well. He says, when I see a flower, I see the beauty of a flower. But when you see a flower, you pick it apart and it becomes a dull thing. And I think he's kind of nutty now that whole beautiful monologue where he basically explains that by understanding why a flower is as it is by understanding its evolution by understanding its color by thinking about the aesthetic quality of the flower and about the insects that are drawn to that aesthetic all of those different things they they do not remove the beauty i was uh, oh i'm gonna can i clang a name drop here oh, right oh, so I was chatting with Steve Martin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done that. I've done that. And he he was in the first episode of, of, of this series of Infinite Monkey Cage, which was such an incredible thing. And um, of course, Steve Martin is a, is a lover of art. And he is another person who, you know, philosophy and science, he's interested in everything. And he at one point was talking about sometimes he gets to a point in art where if he really understands the painting, if he really believes he's got to a level of understanding the painting and the meaning behind the painting, the painting is no longer as beautiful as it was. Now, of course, that doesn't happen in most pieces. So, you know, most great pieces of art, you will find your subjective experience. You will never get a true. But he said, you know, he found that interesting. There's a couple of pieces where he went, oh, I've, I've lost the beauty of that. And I don't think, to me anyway, from my outsider perspective, that happens with, with science. I, I think the more I can see how you can fall out of love with something. I can see that if you have a particular idea, if you think, right, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to work on for my whole life. And eventually you go, I've still got nowhere further with this idea. I can see you will fall out of a love, love with that idea. But I think overall, beauty is never removed by a greater understanding. I think it will always increase that when I look at what, what during the lockdown, I've got a little garden and I was doing exercise every day. And I found myself I was next to a daffodil. And every single day, I took a picture of the daffodil because the daffodil was sprightly at the beginning because it was spring. And then slowly the daffodil dried and you could see the life leaving it. And every and then people on Instagram became incredibly, it, it, there was an emotional attachment to the daffodil. You haven't put a picture up of the daffodil. How is the daffodil? And watching the process of that daffodil's decline and having some understanding of the nature of the seasons and how uh, the reproduction of flowers made that process even more beautiful than had it merely been the beauty of a daffodil alone. Yeah, I think I, I completely agree. I think looking into the minutia of nature is one of the great joys that I think we can all attest to. Um, and I'm, I imagine you spent your fair share of time traveling the globe. How does humor and comedy differ between cultures? Um, does your particular comedic flavor translate across to these cultures? I know you rely on a lot of like, references and you know, you've got a, a bouquet of voices that you do. Is there an objective humour that translates into every culture? I love that I've got a bouquet of voices. That's a beautiful thing. A bouquet of Brian Blessed. So that's one of my favourites, as you know. The, it's an interesting thing because, of course, that's one of the tools that I will very often lose. When th This time, where was I this time last year? This time last year, I think I would have been in Auckland, in New Zealand. And uh, if I was, I was talking with Brian Cox today and we were saying how ridiculous it is that this year, I think the actually I did go to Toronto this year and I got as far as Stornoway in Scotland, but that's it. Whereas last year we did, you know, USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Singapore. Overall, there are, as you as you point out there, that there are cultural divides. There are certain points where you go. Well, the, the most interesting one, because obviously there were certain voices that I knew were well, I can't use that, and I can, I can replace most things with a different kind of character or personality, and it does make you work harder, and and that's a lot of fun. It's a it's a horrible moment when you're you're through you're going through one of what is undoubtedly what you consider to be your best routines, and you then go, oh, I've just realised the punchline is parochial. This will not play in Brisbane. Um, but overall, the, the, it's an odd, like in America, in the US anyway, there was a very interesting thing, which I, I had a, I was doing a series of jokes about kind of the development of our brains 
uh, in the early stages, one year old, two year old, three year old, four year old, five year old, each, each, each year there was a different step. And it started off before uh, at, at the point of birth and the worry, the worry that we have with psychology now, <clears throat> that when you have a child, how quickly you start to worry, oh my God, what's the one thing I'm going to do that's going to be the one thing that's the wrong thing that means that my child's going to grow up to be a mass murdering serial killer. And I have this whole routine about that. Now, the first night, I think it was in, in Wilmslow in, in the US, um, I did that bit. And it got a laugh. But man, it was a different laugh. It was a much more. And very quickly, I worked out why in the US, that's not as good. And the reason is, and this is very bleak, the reason is the number of mass murdering serial killers, the number of, you know, sometimes week by week, there is another school shooting. And so what was absurd when I was in Peterborough or in Glasgow becomes something which is actually real. So that was an interest. That's it's sometimes it's those things. It's a very different cultural thing to merely a reference point to a musician or a TV personality. It's actually about so so that was overall those it, what was surprising was how little we needed to change. You know, I, I, I changed a lot of the stand up just because I'd done a similar versions for 18 days in, or, or so in the UK. And I thought it would be fun to do something different. I like to change it as much as possible. And certainly Brian and I, a lot of the stuff we do together is improvised and that's fun. But there was also another interesting change, which was at the end of the last show that we did, um, we'd been talking about the nature of time. And I came on and I did a poem about the moment that when you're, you're playing with your child and you're building a den with them and you're wondering if this will be the last time you build a den with them because they're going you know they're not going to want to build dens anymore and you're talking about the difference in the fact that time for children is that big and time when you're middle aged is that big and it gets smaller and smaller and then brian would come on right at the end and he would talk about the fact that the very laws that mandate there must be life in the universe are the same laws that mandate our lives must be finite. For there to be life to exist, there must be death as well. And um, in the UK, you know, it was, it, there was lots of nice discussions afterwards and stuff. But in the US, that, and, and much more so than Canada as well, you know, that border is very specific there. That hit much harder, not in a negative way. It's not like we have people with placards outside from kind of, you know, crazy fundamentalist sects or anything like that. But you could see that in a culture where I, I feel certainly in, in terms of an English speaking culture, there is a level of mysticism that is a lot more than you see in Australia or Canada or in the UK. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of the people we work with, they might not have religion, but they would kind of go, but ghosts, I mean, is it really true they break the second or third dynamics? Because I kind of want to believe that. There, there did seem to be within that culture, I felt, a, a, a greater predilection for, for beliefs which, which verge on the kind of, of, of mystic. And so that point of talking about death was, it felt a lot more potent. It felt like a, a much greater philosophical, it felt, you know, in Brighton, it felt like people were going, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in, you know, places in Wisconsin, it was like, whoa. Oh. And you could see a different, the way that they left. The pause at the end as the lights went out, there was a different sense of, oh. And that's really intriguing to me. Of uh, something that I've, I've wondered for a while. Uh, obviously, you, as a comic, you get up, you stand in front of people. The, the job is, the goal is to make people laugh. You, you mentioned there when you don't get a laugh. What like when I'm watching and that happens if I'm at a comedy gig and you know they they say punchline to a joke and there's no laugh or, you know I feel like a part of my soul is is it do, do the comics on the stage get that feeling or is it something that you just get used to over time? No, you must never get used to that. I don't think. I, I think, I mean, it's an interesting thing that some comics, a bit like the old musical days, they get a very solid set and they may well not change it for years. And we've all had periods of time like that when you're working the clubs in the early days, you're so worried about your next booking that sometimes you think, I'm going to stick with that. I'm going to stick with that routine. It works. And then you might find yourself a decade later going, I'm still sticking with that routine. I must try something else. And I can sometimes find for those comics, there's a kind of rhythm and they go, nah, it didn't work tonight. Um, but for most comics that I know, you must, you know, you, you, if you get, if you start just going, I can deal with, you know, I'm fine with that. You're going to stop creating 
you have to that moment that confrontation sorry I'm dropping the mic there that that uh i should have picked a wider book uh i picked hp lovecraft which is not merely a, a book that's not wide enough for my microphone uh but on top of that it also does have uh, uh mysticism demons and of course uh cthulhu so that was a very dangerous book to uh, that's the necronomicon about to open up but it's um no i i, I i've never i'm ne i mean i'm very rarely satisfied with any gig even a gig that that for any and I used to have a problem where sometimes after a gig, uh, I I would put things on social media going, oh you know I'm really hey hey Plymouth that wasn't a great gig and da, 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 da. and I get all these people going what are you talking about we had a great time we I I don't know what and I'd realise it, it's something that a friend of mine Philippa Perry who's, who's a wonderful therapist when I was interviewing her, her a few years ago for a, for a book that I was doing she said the problem with being human is we judge everyone else from the exterior and we judge ourselves from the interior and so that means quite often at a gig. You, all you are seeing is imperfections. All you can find between the, the big laughs, you notice that fault and that fault. And you wonder if that person there is being a bit twitchy. They're a little bit bored. And that person there's coughed. Have they got a tickly cough? Or they, 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 they've noticed their throat. But, you know, all of that, you know, there is, there's a lot of voices in your head during that thing. And I, and I you know, w will work as hard as I can. I never want an audience. To, they might end up going, do you know what? That wasn't my thing. But I would never want to go, and he didn't put much into it. You know, I will put, everything everything that i can think of to think i want to make especially when i think of the fact that people have spent money they've come to see me and so i want to make sure that even if they're unimpressed they notice the sweat you know i'm going to make sure i laugh at every single joke at every comedy gig i go to no don't do that because uh, that'll give us a false sense of security you know we'll, 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 we'll storm oxford and then of course you know once we, we only have to go as far as didcot the people haven't moved on with us you know the didcot audience we go oxford was having us on it's an important thing as well there's a it's a very barry crier the great you know comedian who's who's uh 60 years now probably over 60 years he's performing and he said once in his 50s he used to do a double act with a, a wonderful comedian called willie rushton and uh one night willie rushton said to him barry you've fallen out of love with the jokes and he realized what he meant he willie rushton could tell that he was just doing the jokes and it always has to be more than that. It has to be, to me, part of, of, of a possession almost. When you go on, I was interested, I was watching Nick Cave the other night. Nick Cave's one of my, my favorite performers of all time. It's absolutely remarkable uh, lyricist and performer and all the things. And I was surprised to hear him say, I, um, I'm nervous beforehand. I think, how am I going to have the energy? And why is anyone listening? He was saying all these things. You think, not you, though. And when you actually find out that almost every performer that you like, if they aren't experiencing some form of, of nervousness, of, of fear, of heightened senses, are, you know, if they're not experiencing that, I wonder how much that they, they love it in the first place. So the, the dem dissemination of science and um, the scientific knowledge to the public via the medium of TV, of radio, has until like quite recently quite restricted to you know fairly serious factual documentaries where like where now you can sort of actually have a laugh with whilst learning about physics of back of black holes or the metabolic pathways of an earthworm as listening to your um your podcast the infinite monkey cage <laughs> how has the role of science co communication evolved over time uh, that you've been working in the industry well i, th I think it's it's a weird thing that Infinite Monk Cage, because we've been doing it for so long, 120 whatever episodes, um, sometimes Brian and, and me, we forget that it's still quite an unusual thing, still quite an unusual way of, of dealing with uh, science. Um, and when we first started it, there were some reviewers who were very sniffy and snotty with us because they had got science is presented like this. Hello, welcome to science. Today, we're looking at the planet Saturn and and that's it everything has to be dealt with with a level I mean like for instance when, when we did the show that we've just recorded with with four astronauts we had Helen Sharman and uh, Nicole Starr and, and Rusty Schweikart and Chris Hadfield we were all quite jokey as well it was quite informal and I think I found that sometimes doing gigs with 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 astronauts I know what a weird thing doing gigs with astronauts so much fun um that they're so used to people going now you've been to the moon you know, the, this must have been the most amazing. The, the, no one treats them as human beings. And I think that was one of the things that we always wanted to do with Monk Cage was 
scientists are people with with passions and in, interests and senses of humor and we don't want to just say tell us about your wonderful work with your strange brain we wanted to you know the, the whole thing the, the humanizing bit was a very important part and i think i've seen you know more and more of that uh and he said what it's so it's such a joy you know sometimes when you get a certain guest on again actually the first time we did monkey cage in america i think some of the scientists were slightly thrown by the fact that we were not doing proper science communicate we were chatting about dinosaurs and, and 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 chatting about extraterrestrial intelligence and its possibilities and all those things we were having a conversation which may go off on many tangents i mean that's one of the things that i again the joys of of working with all these people is when Brian and I sit down beforehand with our producer, Sash, and we kind of scribble down, right, this is probably three parts. We, we normally try and have in each show three places that we're going to go. Um, we very rarely get past question two because someone answers and you go, and that, and that I think is also part of my favourite interviewers to watch My fa- are when you know that they are reactive. They're not just going, we've spent two weeks working out all the questions we're going to ask this person. When you see that joy of, of, of re- that joy of, hey, hang on, you've just told me an idea that's blown my mind and I want to, I want to explore that more. So that's a lot, that, that's a, a very important part of it for us, which is we may well fail to achieve what was written up on the board, our imaginary board of this is the journey of the show. And it's also, that's one of the reasons I think is we never want to deliver to people a module that they can just take away and say, oh good, I know about that subject now. What we uh, hope we deliver are enough interesting ideas that people go, I must go to the library immediately. I must go to the internet. I must look this up. I must see this person's YouTube film. I must find out that's what we want them to be excited to go on you know further journeys with these ideas i think the beauty of it or especially for me it's you know it's indistinguishable from just sitting around with your mates and chatting about these sort of things that's what it comes across as as a show rather than like you said a, you know a very structured scientific program it's a it's a chat amongst friends about some really interesting topics which is you know well, why i love yeah, it so that- much. Glad you, you find that because that's really what we what we want it to be, and it's it's uh, and I mean this series in particular, I've got to admit, we've and it's been interesting because of course we've not been together. Every one of us has been in a different room, in a different basement, in a different attic, whatever, and it's been very interesting to see. I think one way is because people have got so used to very quickly using this form of technology. Um, and it has a level of informality that I don't. The, the one that we did about space archaeology the other day and about evolution with with Alice Roberts and Sarah Parkak and Sarah Pasco, that uh, they're always all those people are, are fantastic minds and tremendously fun to work with. But I think we went even further and even stranger because we were so relaxed. Because you literally you've just come out of your kitchen, you've got a cup of tea, ping, hello, oh yeah, we'll just start recording in a minute, and off you go. And then we have this fascinating thing, which is because of the, the wonderful uh, use of technology, where we now have an audience, which is 200 people, all of whom are each sat on their own in there. And they're there going Way! like that. And somehow it all comes together and we hear an audience. And apparently that's what, yeah. You know, but that I love, I mean, this is one of the things that I found, again, looking for the positives in something which is a negative thing, such as a pandemic and the situation that's been going on and the lives that have been lost that were unneeded. You have to also go, what can we find that is we can take away from this? And I think one is the desire for people to connect, the hunger for people to go, let's find a way of making sure that some people who might be alone and some people left out are not left alone. I think that that and the other thing that I found fascinating with this thing is because we've had such a reduced landscape to look at, I think like that exercise daffodil I was mentioning, people have really been focusing on smaller squares, squares of the sky, squares of their community, whatever. And I think that has absolutely nothing to do with the question you asked. (laughs) Very clearly. <laughs> as I said, well, tangential is one of my hobbies. As you as you mentioned before, you you know you've done well over a hundred um, episodes of Infinite Monkey Cage. Now I think are you on your twenty second season? Yeah, twenty second series. Nearly um, the end of that. Yeah. So um, you've met your fair share of scientists and academics. I think that's fair to say. What what do you think gets them most excited, and why do they enjoy what they do? Um. I think it, it is. It's the hoped for revelation. 
and it's the fact that not only when you get i mean one of one of the beauties i think of of uh of, of revelations you know using the scientific method is a revelation is never a conclusion as well you know when you you look at you know that that, that beautiful moment where you see peter higgs sat in an auditorium seeing the results that have come from the Large Hadron Collider, and he sees that his idea 50 years before was a good idea. And what is beautiful about that is, yes, it goes, Peter, you're right, but it doesn't then go, shut down the, all the colliders now, we're done, we've, we've found it out. From that grow all of these other questions. So I think that's part of the thing that I've I've seen as a it is a I mean everyone that I work with pretty much with very rare exceptions is excited and excitable and is filled with when when we sit in the green room before a show happens it's never quiet. Everyone has always got. We're not going to talk about this in the show tonight. But there was something that I read that you wrote. I think it was a paper that you did. Everyone has questions, and and that goes the other way. To you know, with the comedians on, you know, there'll be someone who go, oh, "I saw the routine that you did, and there was something you did. I think I, I saw it at the Oxford Playhouse, and you did." Everyone wants to to share ideas, and everyone wants. Very rarely do you get grandstanding. Very rarely do you get someone delivering a monologue, which is is merely a a, a moment of of of, of self aggrandizing. Everyone wants to take something else from someone else's mind. Everyone else wants to know what's in there and go, oh, that's the thing that I wanted to know more about. So I, th I think it is that there's, it's a, the, what I've always, the, the more that I learn about, about science and the more that I learn about humanity, I think is, is the beautiful thing, which is there is no conclusion. In the same way that I, I talk a lot with a, a wonderful cosmologist called Carlos Frank. I don't know if you know Carlos, he's based stuff in Durham. Uh, and during lockdown, quite often on a Wednesday, we just kind of meet up between five and 6.30. We, we meet up over Zoom and we, ha and, and we have a chat. And we were talking the other day about the fact that people do want definites. People want a, you know, consciousness. What is consciousness now whatever the answer eventually is to what is consciousness i think people will be very disappointed because what they actually want i think very often is an answer that is magic somehow or other and it won't be that when we eventually if we do find that there's so you know that consciousness as a whole is something that can be summarized in a series of equations at that point there will then be loads more questions in the same way if we ever manage to work out what happened into what that that first 10 to the minus 43 of a second of the beginning of the universe it will not be a conclusion i do not believe we'll then be able to go oh that's the beginning of the universe everything else is sorted you will find on that timeline there is now a new timeline that is required or a new lack of timeline that's required if we ever manage to find to pinpoint the first where life itself begins the transition from inanimate to animate that will not be the final answer so i think that is one of the things that uh, i i see collectively amongst a lot of the people i work with which is we know that we will die ignorant we know we will die with more things to know. And that to me is a far more exciting proposition than being given a series of rules where you go, and this is everything about the universe. That's it. And this, here's your meaning. Your meaning is this. Is it? Yeah, yeah. We did a pamphlet on your meaning. Okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, you must have heard of, like you, to the in the green room where you're discussing ideas, you must have heard so many fantastic ideas from so many, you know, brilliant minds if you had unlimited funds and resources do you have like a particular area of research that you would allocate these to like what excites you most in the field at the moment it's really hard do you know what it changes almost weekly because you read a new idea and it becomes so like consciousness for instance is not in that I'm I'm not I, I I did a lot of reading around this and I eventually found it to be a problem that I found slightly boring. It's a problem that I was much more excited by what we were able to do with our consciousness than to uh, it felt to me like oh, let's not waste time. It almost, again it feels almost narcissistic what we should mainly work on it. No 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 let's move. I mean I do find that idea of what happens within a black hole. I do find that idea of you know if if we do end up only being able to see you know here is this this almost two dimensional surface at the event horizon i find that idea of two dimensionality from information projected from another place i find that utterly fascinating i find the idea of the block universe i find the idea that 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 time is is a block and that we have this strange personal experience which has a beginning a middle and an end and all that but that, that is in some ways a, a, a delusion stroke illusion 
I find that very very fascinating so those kind of things are i mean there's lots of other things you know multiverse and many worlds others, but I, I do find in particular uh understanding of time and you know both from the perspective of a black hole from a i mean i also i i to find out you know our understanding of how the universe ends or doesn't end or what is left i find that an incredible thing so there's no one thing that i i mean i would like to, i the greater the technology to look further and further out to the universe is you know whatever and i know there's going to be a limit i know there's a point where you go this is as far as we can look but for me one of the most exciting things is looking at you know when you look at the cosmic microwave background radiation and you look at those tiny tiny differences in heat tiny you know and you realize that all of those different you know that that tiny difference in heat is a huge amount of what is now matter and planets and us and blackberries and the rings of saturn all that i find that is is uh you know that that to me is, is, is i suppose quite close to what is sometimes considered to be a religious experience to be able to look that far back and see that level you know that it is that's that's the scan that's that's going and you know there is the pregnant person and there they are having a scan and this is what you see in the scan that that to me is a, is, a, is a really amazing thing yeah i, I was expecting you would say to research how brian cox keeps his hairline but that was uh... <laughs> i know how he keeps them i can never tell <laughs> and finally what does happiness mean to you yeah, it's it's a weird, you know. Sometimes it is just staring at the sky. I, I was talking the other week with doing some some event when we we still kind of did outside events that there is. I mean, my ultimate happiness thing is playing crazy golf with my son in a seaside town after going to a good bookshop and knowing that there's an ice cream store we're going to go to afterwards. That is a very, you know, we we are both uh, huge fans of crazy golf. We go to Hastings uh, a lot. There's three different courses there. That's one of, the, and there is. Then there is that happiness, which is an experience, which is barely experienced. You know, that moment where you have just, and it might be you lying on the grass and you're looking at Venus and you're just, and you're, you're seeing more and more of the stars kind of the, the, as the, the more you stare, as you know, the more light kind of the, the, the sky becomes more populated in your mind. And there is that moment where you go, I think I was just, I had a transcendent moment. And by observing it, it disappears, of course. But that, that is a very joyous moment where you go, the sensation goes by the observation of it, but you know that something magnificent and delightful has happened. Well, that's uh, an incredible answer. And thank you so much. Uh, I think my time for questions is up. So I'll open oh, up the thank floor. Thank you. And, no, thank you. And um, yeah, I'll pass over to Matt. Brilliant. Thanks uh, very much, Chris. That's question. great. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thanks, Robin. That was really, really entertaining and uh, enjoyed what you had to say. We've got lots of questions from our audience. So I'll kick off with a question from Madison Parker, which we had to tweak slightly because you addressed her, the first part of her question during the talk. Uh, but can you educate people about science and rationality using humour, uh, especially across cultures? Yeah, I think you can. I mean, I think one of the things that we, the, that we, we know is that if someone laughs with you, their mind immediately becomes more ready to receive ideas. So that bit, I mean, you know, with, with what we do with monkey cages, I, I do, I, I was, I'd like to say I play the idiot, but I may, it may well be a part that I play 24 hours a day. Yeah. And a lot of, of, I think if, you know, the function when Brian and I are doing live shows is one for me to humanize him by being a little bit rude, being this strange, you know, this strange little bald man being, being rude to the beautiful physicist. Um, and, and also saying to people, do not worry if you I don't understand it all. There's a huge number of things that, you know, a lot of what I've played with on stage is playing with that idea of how difficult certain ideas are, but it doesn't mean they shouldn't be attractive to you. Um, and, I, and I think that that combination, that combination of someone who does have any, I mean, Brian is really uh, remarkable at his ability. When, when we do the Q&As and he, you know, just, Here's, I, I never show the questions beforehand. They've been tweeted in normally, 12,000 people, and I just throw things and throw. And there was one about a slinky once, which was the most fun. I think we were out in uh, Sydney. And um, both of us were working together on trying to work out something that neither of us in any way knew. And it was a really, and, and the joy of watching that. But then there's a, a, a lovely thing, which is one of my favorite bits is sometimes Brian will get a question and go, oh, I don't know. And then I'll look at the audience and go, oh, thank heavens. He doesn't know. There's a thing he doesn't know. So I, I think 
all of it is about being it, it's to show that it's play a lot of science a lot of any form of understanding whether it's you know philosophical or whatever it might be is it should be about play that you're toying with things. Yeah, this is one of the reasons that I'm, you know, hugely admire uh, my, my friend Alan Moore, who you know wrote *League of uh, Extraordinary Gentlemen* and *Watchmen* and *V for Vendetta* and all those things. Alan loves playing with ideas. So when you read some of his comic books, Tom Strong comic books and things like that, he is playing with scientific ideas. And sometimes, I mean, we had a great one once where Brian Green was on as well. And I highly recommend Brian Green's new book, Until the End of Time. It's a great book. And Alan was sitting there going, well, in one of the stories where I had a planet so massive that it was bending time. And I do realize that some people might not. And then every time he would say something which he'd been very playful with and he believed entirely misrepresented the science, Brian Green would go, no, 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 that, yeah, that would be scientifically accurate. And, and then Alan was just sitting there going, I'd never realised what a genius I was, you know, but it's kind of, um, so I think, yes, a lot of it is about telling people it is play. Play is part of, you know, there is a point you have to refine and there is a point obviously where it has to become a paper, or whatever, but a lot of those papers come from playfulness. Thanks. Joanna Shirabuki asks, do you have any tips on how to get over the fear of public speaking? We sort of touched on that again in the talk. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it is very hard, though, actually, because I, I forget sometimes, because even though before most gigs, I will find some way of being nervous. Sometimes it's nothing to do with the anxiety performance. It's that kind of thing that just before you go on, especially at a big gig, I know what I'm doing, but then I suddenly think, what if I suddenly need to loo the moment I get on there? What if I walk on, there's 12,000 people, and I go, I'm so sorry, Brian, I've got to go. I need it. You, know, all of the, you, you will always find a way of being anxious. And eventually, I think you will. I mean, I used to when when I was a teenager. I remember at a school debate once. I just went off on one, and I did this rambling tangential routine. I got loads of laughs, and that was really the starting point of being able to publicly speak. But all the way through, I had one knee that was just going. Just that was where all the shaking was. Um, so. You'll never, the idea of getting over it will never happen, but you just, you, you have to, one, you have to know that you really want to express those ideas. So make sure if you want to public speak, you know, just think, I really want to share these. And more often than not, if, you know, like, don't worry about laughs, don't worry about any of those things. You, you're the first few times you may well stumble, or you may well be brilliant for the first five times and then you stumble. You know, there's no continuum necessarily. But um, to know, that nearly everyone you have ever watched on stage has, is beforehand. I mean, I, I wanted to do a project once where we took a photo of a performer just before they went on stage and a photo the moment they got to the microphone. Because the difference in the, you know, da, 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 you know, is huge. There is something that there is a physical wreck. There is so much going on with, with your adrenaline, with the dopamine, all of those things. So the thing to know is be aware that everyone is scared. Very few people walk on stage without inside, but you don't see that. So you think, and again, that bit I mentioned before about the outside and the inside is a very important part for all of us in our life. It's very often when we sometimes keep things hidden, things that we should share. Sometimes, you know, I'm talking there perhaps about different things in mental health as well, is once you are able to sometimes with your friends admit to something that you believed was strange and only your feeling you will more often than not find out that it is shared by many people. And that, that is one of the joys of the kind of stand-up that I'm involved with now is sometimes you talk about an idea on stage and you've made something ridiculous that may well have come from an anxiety or another kind of, and um, the number of people who go, I really thought it was, I mean, there was a, I, I used to talk about this when I was promoting my book a while ago where one night where after some man came up to the bar and went, I'm a bit annoyed with you. And I went, Oh, sorry, what have I done? He went, well, I've spent my whole life believing I'm quite weird, but I've just sat and watched your show with your audience and I've realised we're all bloody weird, which means I'm quite normal, which is <laughs> disappointing. Now, that moment was a, you know, that that's one of the things that drives me on is also that. I realise that a lot of people in my audience may well have some sense that they're on the outside. And that bit of saying, don't worry, there's a, a lot of us here. In fact, there's so many that we might be on the inside, actually. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Okay, our next question comes from Christina A, who's looking for a bit of inspiration. She says, I'm currently a DPhil student in physical chemistry, and I find that it's very difficult to communicate the beauty of chemistry in the world. Do you have any suggestions for a budding science communicator? What I would say is it's very easy, and I've done this as a stand-up as well. It's very, and I still do it. I make far too many notes. I think I'm going to talk about far too many ideas. What I would say is think of one idea 
that you find particularly beautiful. And it might be an idea that you think there's only a minute in it, and you're probably wrong about it. I mean, it may well, you might not think that, but if you can think of, and especially for science communicator, if you can think of one image as well, that you can connect to that one beautiful idea and just think of all the different ways that you can explore. And I mean as small an idea as possible because, yeah, if you can think of one thing in, in your discipline that you particularly love, that's the, I mean, I think that is, to use the old Carl Sagan thing about when people said to Carl Sagan, why do you want to communicate science? He said, because when you're in love, you want to tell the whole world. And I think that's a very important thing to remember in science communication is if you, if you start from love, don't start from any idea about what, how you want to educate people, anything like that. Start from an idea that you like, you know, people now, now I imagine it's just, you know, they make a Spotify playlist, but you know, when I was growing up, it was a cassette and you would give a cassette to the first time you went out with someone going, these are the bands I really like. Hope you really like these bands too. And you're really hoping they love those ideas too. And that's what you want to do with your science talk is you want to have the equivalent of that song that you love and you want everyone else to love that song as well. Great. Next question comes from John Lucy. He asks, hi, Robin, any plans to do extended live video talks such as this for the Infinite Monkey Cage production, given the restrictions that are currently in place for the foreseeable future? Well, we would at the moment there are we we were going to try and actually record the like the, this version so that people could actually see uh, visually what we were doing, um, but for the time being, for various different kind of I think legal reasons and stuff like that, we're not able to. But we will be doing. I mean, it looks now like the series that's going out at the moment will be hopefully nine rather than just six uh, episodes. We want to extend it as much as possible, um, and so. Though, we, though we're not able, and, and, and Brian and I as well, and, and other friends of mine, I do do a thing, I do a Sunday science Q&A uh, every Sunday with Helen Chersky and various different guests. We had Susie Imber recently on, and uh, Brian Cox did it, and Brian Green, and Sarah Parkak, and uh, I'll get Jan Levin on soon. So every Sunday I do a, a thing not dissimilar to this in which we, we have, we take live questions from people and do an hour hour and a half but but with monkey cage for the time being i'm afraid you will, you will have to make do with with what we're creating but we as i said hopefully a series of nine we've got nearly uh six done uh the first three are out um i mean you know so um and, and my, one of my favorites is the one that's out at the moment which was sarah parkak and uh and sarah pasco and alice roberts talking about space archaeology which was so much fun and next week's the one with the four astronauts was just so much uh, a joy so we will keep making things and i will certainly even when monkey cage ends there will be i, I think with, with cosmic shambles who I, I do with my mate Tramp, trent we make all this stuff and we are generally making uh five or six or seven shows a week with different people sometimes about science sometimes about art and culture i I'll be next week i'll be doing another of my kind of talks which has a little bit more about psychology and mental health i'm a joke on 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 thursday um and in fact i should mention if it's okay for me to say this yeah, immediately sure. after this at, at 7 30 on cosmic shambles uh we are doing a, a covid19 uh panel with uh three people immunologists and uh um mathematical modelers talking about that which is a, again a live q a thing so certainly i like making as much stuff as possible i love the fact we can communicate with people in different hemispheres and different time zones we all gather together yeah wonderful keep, keep making stuff that's that's our motto <laughs> uh next one is jason caras caras says what has been the most difficult scientific concept for you to translate into comedy or for you to communicate to a lay audience that is do you know what it's very i would actually say sometimes it is and this is going to seem like such a cliche but quantum theory after a while you realize you're very, very surface on the jokes. You're very talking about wave particle duality. Uh, you, you know, there's a certain number of cat jokes you can get away with, a certain number of ways you can kind of anthropomorphize a particle. Um, I think, I mean, the next one I've been mentioning black holes, and that's what I'm working on at the moment is trying to come up. And I think that that is. Once you've done a certain amount of reading, you think you're able to translate more information as jokes than you actually are. So I think always the hardest thing is how quickly can you give an audience enough information for them then to realize that the punchline is some kind of twist? Because punchlines are, you yeah. know, kind of moments <laughs> of uh, the unexpected. And if you're not careful, you realize either you've got a 15 minute setup to a joke 
which is far too long, um, or your joke is ultimately unsatisfactory. So I think the next one, I basically talk about what I'm de dealing with in the present, and, and that is going to be talking about holographic principle and then different ideas of, of, uh, of, of what lies beyond the event horizon. And that's not proving to immediately reward with punchlines that will live on in perpetuity. Hannah Sinclair says, as a female scientist, I wonder why there's a paucity of great female science communicators. Would you ever consider working with one? Oh, yeah, no, there's loads. I mean, as I said, in fact, the last show that we did was uh, Sarah Parkak and, uh, and Alice Roberts. And, and I work with Helen Chersky every single uh, week on, on the Sunday science Q&A. And I think what we have seen is a uh, remarkable change in, uh, I mean, like everything, the, the problem with so much and so many cultural problems we have, and of course what we're watching happen at the moment, is it's very easy for someone in my position as you know, a, a middle-class white male to not realize that almost from the moment I was born, I had permission to go into certain areas. I had permission, to, whereas you know, in, in, in science, I, it, it used to be much harder in the early days of Monkey Cage to be able to, you know, we try as much as possible to in the overall in a series get parity between male and female scientists you know and sometimes there will be a show which is all female scientists as much as possible we try never to have one which is all male scientists because that is the way things are too often and and very rarely i think in the last few series has that happened certainly i, I can't think immediately of a time like that in the so like the astronaut show you know we, it was important for us to try and make sure it wasn't going to be all male astronauts so that's why we had chris hadfield and uh, and we had rusty schweikart but we also had nicole stott and and we also had uh helen Sharman. so yes the answer is yes and i i i think what we're seeing is there's 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 a few people who who really pushed ahead and did not stop and had tremendous tenacity and now that you have people more and more and i hope we see this increasing in the public sphere it means that people can say oh i am allowed to do that too and that's what often gets forgotten if you are in a position of privilege what you don't realize is that that's why when people get annoyed about going oh well this oh star wars the reason that they've got this kind of cast is only about which you know what part of it is also just to say why can't girls grow up and say i can be that particular superhero i know they're not superheroes in star wars i'm not really that au fait to be honest i don't concentrate when i take the sun to see them but you know the, all of those things or john boyega all of those things are saying ah oh, i can be the hero I can be center stage. So I think it, you know, it's important. I, I agree with it. It's very, very important that we try as much as possible. You know, as has as been talked about, I'm sure many times before, if you find yourself asked to do a panel at a conference and you find out that it is all white men, then sometimes you have to go, do you know what? I'm going to stand down. And could you find someone else, someone from uh, uh, who is not of, of my stereotypical background? I think, you know, and, and we have to try and do that more and more. Thank you. Artish Laya asks, who are your favorite scientists, engineers, philosophers, and science communicators? Maybe just pick one of those? Or wow, man. There's <laughs> however, so, you wanna, well, however you want to play I mean, <laughs> There's so many people that I uh, I, I really... I mean, I, I mentioned uh, the, the, the work of Jana Levin is some of my favourite... Her, her book, How the Universe Got Its Spots, and Black Hole Blues. And she also wrote a novel as well, which is uh, Einstein's in the title. I've forgotten what it is. Uh, she, no, no, The Turing Machine. That's the one. Um she's she's a I, I love reading her work and i thoroughly enjoy talking to her about stuff um i my, i mean yeah brian i do love working with i'm not going to deny that i think he's absolutely brilliant i'm, I'm in a very fortunate position Yeah, you know, i mentioned already alan moore i find philosophically that he is a fascinating man way you know comic books may well still be considered by some people to be uh, a flippancy where his work is certainly uh not flippant uh i and i do love richard Feynman. i do find that the you know he helped you and i um, and another of, of my favorites is Miriam Rothschild. If you've never seen, uh, there's a beautiful show called uh, a, a, a series um, done by a friend of mine, Chris Sykes, which was um, called Seven Wonders, where scientists would pick their seven wonders. And, and Miriam Rothschild did an enormous amount of work on fleas and yeah, about the jump of fleas. Incredible, groundbreaking, really important. Work. And she was just this fascinating person who's there. She's got all these rabbits that she combs the fleas off. Then she gets a bit of chloroform, which doesn't kill the fleas, but just makes them a little bit woozy so you're trying to make fleas woozy with chloroform and that was how she measured and she's one of those people that every time i watch that documentary and every time i read her work again the joy of the curiosity and all of that is such an important part of it 
but there's a huge list. I mean, I could just go to my bookshelf <laughs> now. I, I it, there, there, there's, there's, and I know that I've missed an enormous number of 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 people off there as well. Great. And our final question. Uh, apologies to the person sending this. Uh, your name is in Thai script, so we couldn't pick out quite what it was. But hi, Robin. Were there any difficulties when you first started in finding an audience that liked the niche of a comic looking at science? Uh, how did you come those difficulties or low points? Now, the odd thing is, it wasn't, you know, and it was, it was difficult for me to make satisfying shows sometimes. I think the problems were very much in terms of an audience. I mean, this is one of the things that dr drives me on. And certainly when I was working in TV years ago and very dissatisfied and often finding that it was very cynical, a lot of it was cynical. And I very often found that I felt audiences are tremendously underestimated. I think mm -hmm. that people have, uh, and that was one of the main drives behind me starting to do these live shows. And then fortunately that led to Monkey Cage and all the stuff that I've done since then. But I found right from the start, when I first, I mean, the, the, the one that I, I could tell myself, tell that story before, but I, I, I started doing a Christmas show. And originally it was called Nine Lessons of Carols for Godless People. And the reason it was called that was because I'd been on a panel show, a debate show, and this really awful fundamentalist guy had been going about, you want to ban Christmas? I went, I don't want to ban Christmas. I love Christmas. I think it's a lovely thing. I think celebration is very important and blah, 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 blah. And I got so bored of this kind of negative thing about, atheists all just you know they're no stop enjoying the universe you're all gonna die you know it seemed to be like that so i thought i'll put on a big celebratory christmas show for people who might not necessarily feel that comfortable in the church let's celebrate it with science and right from the start like, like we put on two nights at a lovely theater called the bloomsbury theater and they just sold out immediately and there was such demand that i ended up the very first time i put on one of the science variety shows of that type we ended up selling out the hammersmith apollo you know with three and a half thousand people um, so I think what I found out very early on was there was a tremendous hunger for people to get something that was beyond what was being fed to them and what had been believed. And, and I do always stand by that, you know, that, that idea. Uh, there's, there's a lovely thing. I think it was Lord Reith when he was head of the BBC. Lord Reith, are you going to give the people what they want? No, I'm going to give them something much better than that. And again, Alan Moore, I mentioned him again. Alan once said this, a great line, I think. It's, it said, um, if the audience knew what they wanted, they would be the artist, not the audience. And I think that's an important thing to remember, which is always push it. Like I said, I have made uh, disappointing shows, I, you know, and I will continue to do that. You know, that's going to happen because one of the things is the more you experiment, the, the more if you're pushing things, then sometimes you go, that one didn't work. That was a failure. But in terms of an audience that are out there, I, I was amazed at how many people wanted something different. And again, as long as you don't patronize them, as long as you, and, and I love seeing those moments where sometimes scientists have gone on with an experiment that's gone totally wrong. And there's still been the joy of watching the experiment go wrong, <laughs> of watching the fact that, you know, this is fail, fail again, fail better. So I, I think overall it's been quite remarkable. And I, and I find it amazing with Monkey Cage now that the number of people when we travel the world, you know, and it's a real, joy yeah you know, when you get an email from someone saying i listen to it with my 10 year old son or when you get an email from a grandmother who listens to it with uh her daughter and also her grandson and all of those things you just think oh good we you know this has got this is useful as well it's been a lot of fun to do it must be a wonderful feeling <laughs> It is. It's very, you know, when it fails, it, you know, and I never lose. And I, I tell you something, I still get nervous before every monkey cage. The, the more successful we've been, the more fearful I am that this is going to be the show that's too boring or that my joke's rubbish or the, you know, all of those things. I've never, liked, it's probably the thing that I almost feel the most nervous about for the longest amount of time. When, we, when we're working on the next episode and I'm thinking, oh, right, I know we've got brilliant scientists. We've got to make sure it's brilliant. It has, to, And of course, there will still be ones. As yet, I'm a bit worried about tomorrow's that we're recording about the sun because we've had so much fun with the first four that statistically, does that mean tomorrow's has to be rubbish? I don't know. I'm sure it won't be. <laughs> But on that note, both Chris and I would like to thank you so much for joining us, Robin, and thanks for sharing your perspectives on happiness in the worlds of science and comedy, particularly in these unprecedented times. Oh, well, thank uh, you very much for having me. What a lot of fun it is. I, I hope people are giving you lots of support with this. It's, it's, well, it's, 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 it's a delight. It's great to see. Brilliant. Really great thanks very much. Come and join me on Cosmic Shambles. We're talking about COVID-19 in 20 I was, minutes. <laughs> I was just about to say to encourage all our listeners to check out Robin's uh, current venture, the Cosmic Shambles Network, a platform with podcast, digital content and live events for those with curious minds. And we hope you enjoyed this live stream as event as much as we did. If you want to hear more talks and interviews with field leading scientists and uh, field leading comedians, <laughs> please like, subscribe, follow our Oxford University Scientific 
Society social media channels and our collaborating partners going live. If you'd like to revisit this talk, an edited version will be released as part of the Happiness Festival later this July. And we'll keep you updated. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you.